Good readings and salutations, all you beautiful people of this beautiful planet. Eric and Mark here with you for another epi of League Unlock. And as the LPL playoffs roll on, we are just treated to five game banger after five game banger. Silver Scrapes returns to the LPL. JDG making their playoff debut. And I'm, I'm going right to the turning point of this series, Mark. And it is game two. Because we had a dominant first game out of LNG. We thought JDG might start a little slow in playoffs. They did in game one and the first half of game two. But somehow, a team that's down over 6k gold is able to sneak a Baron? How's that happen? I don't know, man. It should not be happening is the way that you got to be looking at this one. Because you are crystal clear on the call that this is the turning point in the series. This was that opportunity for LNG to storm out of the gates, grab that first game, which, hey, check mark, job done. Very good from the rest of the, the whole the whole squad getting it in, in for first game. Second game, you have those early advantages. And as you said, this is where you grab it by the neck and you control this series. Not the case because that Baron goes over to JDG, double ADCs ripping it through. And that damage afterwards, that push onwards, you see that JDG is online, activated, and ready for the rest of this series. And it's a theme that we've seen, we saw in this series, we've seen the whole year for JDG. If they get any swing of momentum, you know, any 3 for 0 or even 4 for 2 type team fight, this game's over. They're going to snowball and run with that. It happened in game two. We saw it happen in game three as well as the momentum completely shifted to their way. And it's just, you know, got to be another LPL series where we get a pet to kill. My goodness, it never ends. Every day in the LPL is another day for another pen to kill to roll on through this time through this series. And it's, it's just incredible that we actually had this power, this turnaround flip around for JDG to push even forward. And then you get that game four, where we do happen to have LNG find that way to even the series, take us to that game five. This is about as far as JDG has ever been pushed this year at this point in time. Good to see LNG do that feeling strong, diving into game five. Yeah, and you know, full credit to LNG because after that momentum completely shifted, you thought for sure this was probably going to be a 3-1 series for JDG. But they do bounce back. Scout and Tarzan in particular, that mid-jungle duo, had a fantastic series. Pretty much games 1-5. to five. And it's, it's crazy to be looking at this one. And I know that maybe we've been up and down on someone like Kanavi throughout this year. You look at that flip side. You look at what Tarzan was doing in this series. Uh, it's going to be pretty lucky for JDG to escape this one in that type of advantage where you're just getting so outplayed because Tarzan was doing it all that he could for LNG. And then in that fifth game, we had the full gauntlet of 80 carries for Ruler in this one. Aphelios, Zeri, Zaya, Ezreal, and then the Sivir in that game five. But again, one single play comes down in this top side that starts as a 2v3 for JDG. And this is where you see 369's Crocodile get fully unleashed. And it's just like, what do you do? If you're a squad like LNG, you've had players like Tarzan and Scout step up to that elite level for this series. You're taking it on, you've pushed it to the maximum level. And now you gotta deal with that ultimate trump card that comes out from JDG. They say, you've had Ruler, you've had Knight, you've had the pressure. Can you deal with 369? And the answer for a lot of these teams in the LPL is you can't handle all three at the same time. Comes out in game five, triple headed monster from JDG control the series and stay in that winner's side of the bracket and the rumble pick out of zika i think the big thing was that ignite that he rolled not having the pressure to be able to put on the map from the tp that 369 did have on his side and then finally in this fifth game you see a smirk coming out a ruler knight is laughing who by the way now consensus hands down best ari in the world he can say it pretty clearly yeah, you gotta be rolling through with that one. Faker might be crying a little bit, but hey, it's okay, buddy. You got other things that we're gonna be keeping with you for the champion of. Give this one over tonight. Really think that he was exceptional this series. I think you can maybe look at game four and if maybe that's where you're a bit negative on him, but I think at that time, it's just about he's 
pushing that limit. And unfortunately, game four, maybe you go over it once, one or two times type of thing, and the enemy team can capitalize. That's just what's going to happen when LNG is playing at that type of level as well. Good to see that game five, crucially though, comes through and is that clutch big time performer. Hey, he's gearing himself up for another one of these showdowns with his ultra rival in Yagao. Just, you know, could be first of two again in this playoff round between these two squads. But yeah, it's BLG and JDG yet again. Felt like JDG was maybe at about 80% power level throughout this series. Finally saw that full form in that fifth game. But yeah, Kanavi's going to have to be playing at a higher level with the current level that Jun is at if JDG wants to keep up their immaculate record against BLG. That's the thing is even with getting to about 80, maybe even 95% power in that game five, seeing three, six, nine, night ruler all popping off, things going well. You do look at Kanavi, you do look on the other side of what Tarzan was able to bring in this series, and you can see an avenue for these other top level teams in the LPL to crack that armor of this squad of JDG and how you take down this champion going to be a tough task but i think that's your one angle that you're looking at if you're jdg if that gets brought up to any type of level this is that full mecha titan that you're looking at in the lpl then looking at the losers bracket side because again lng played a great series and top esports they didn't go the distance but an incredibly competitive series against blg as well shown that both these squads can put you know the pressure and test these top two. So super excited for that losers final and really TES and LNG are both looking like they're world's caliber teams right now. Oh, how can you remember those years we didn't have a losers bracket and we'd have to just say goodbye, see you later to these type of teams? Uh-uh, we are treated, we are blessed. We are going to be getting, of course, the Knight and Yagao BLG JDG matchup, but don't you fret, we are still having that top esports LNG showdown. Only good times in the LPL right now. And honestly, if you're if you're Weibo and EDG sitting waiting in that regional final, you're watching the level that these teams are putting forward and whew, you're sweating saying that maybe we got to do a couple more blocks of scrims heading into this. You're certainly seeing exactly the type of tier of play that you need to bring to be competitive at that gauntlet tournament round, especially knowing that, okay, you know, You've got your spots. Maybe you're feeling secure in it type of things. You see LNG, top esports, performing like this JDG, BLG, and you know some combination of that is coming down that pipeline into the gauntlet. You better be, your, better be prepared. And, you know, again, in LPL fashion, you probably got five or six teams that are actually world's caliber. But four is all we can send for the moment heading over from China. But any one of the four that end up going will definitely be deserving Unfortunately, we got to talk about a little LCK series that happened today. And you'll notice Mark here is not wearing the T1 sweater today. He's, he's not rocking it, even though you were maybe feeling good after game one against DRX, a relatively clean game out of T1. But games two and three were the furthest thing from clean. My goodness, how is this? I, I don't know. Uh, I'm in disbelief because I can't believe how exceptional things are in the LPL playoffs and that we're seeing. And that I can still see T1 with these four members, the core four is still there, disappoint like this. This series against DRX, you mentioned game one. Good. Great? No. Good. Done the good enough to get it done and make sure that it is T1 taking down that Nexus return for game two and if you had maybe three wheels on that bus to get across the finish line and get the win in game one they had no wheels on that bus in game two the way things were rolling and it's it's just absolutely insane we're at a point where you're saying well at least they want to see a game they want a game in the series and this you know DRX, drx drx was their first match after faker stepped away from that starting lineup and this is where the saga kind of began, and now they're sitting at one and six. And listen, a few weeks ago, you and I were both saying, whatever, they're going to limp into playoffs. Maybe Faker comes back and they play well there. I mean, there's an angle now where I see them potentially missing playoffs. It would involve them losing out the rest of the regular season, but they keep playing like this. That's a legit possibility. Well, what's up next? 
KT Rolster. Okay, yeah, let's that's an L. move on. Yep. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Telecom or L at this point, barring anything absolutely crazy. And then you move on to the further ones and you're looking at, you know, this last type of week and you've got matches against Guangdong Freaks, Lift Sandbox, certainly teams that you're in contention, believe it or not, for that last playoff spot, T1 fans. That is going to be where it is do or die. And at that point, it's still most likely, and given what we've heard from owner talking about the issues Faker is still struggling with, should still be just these four and Poby. You got to find a way to be better. As you mentioned, we expected, uh, yeah, they'll just limp on through to playoffs. No problem, because you envision that somewhere along this path, you're picking up a win here. You're getting this series against a squad like DRX. You're one and six at this point without Faker. The worst of all the records that you would be looking at of any of these teams in the LCK, it is a miracle savior that you have that six and two record with Faker in the lineup to start with. This is absolutely going downhill at a remarkable speed. And I think I saw this roster with Faker in the LCK is something like they have six series losses total. They're like 56 and six overall. Now you got six series losses in seven games. Uh, the slump that's happened for them. And the biggest issue here is you can talk about individually, mechanically. Okay, maybe Kyrie and Owner aren't quite at the level that we're used to seeing out of them, sure. But the bigger concern is what's going on behind the scenes. And not even just communication on the rift, but it, it just feels like the confidence and the body language from these guys, they seem like they're broken and that is much harder to bounce back from than not performing well individually and i think a lot of these signs of being you know having it being fractured behind the scenes are things that are going to happen with young players you know young people when you're going through these experiences for the first time i know someone mentioned you know look back to last year on drx when you had Piosik calling Barrel a bug or something like that. Barrel's able to say, whatever, man. It's a, you know, it's a stupid hot-headed comment type of thing. I still got to work with this guy and find a way to make things right on the riff. That was one of the big things. You're looking at a veteran like him. And so people are looking at this and know that, you know, Curious, someone that is an extremely emotional player, rides the very highs of highs in those good plays and rides the lows of lows of being, you know, depressed and upset at what is happening on the rift and the performance that can absolutely translate to the conversations between teammates and something can happen all that said it still needs to be sorted out and done professionally and performance on the rift needs to be there especially for an organization like t1 whether it's right or not that is the expectation and it is not being delivered and again it feels like more than just performance on the rift the massive hole left by Faker is you had these four young players and the clear consensus leader. Like, no question, this is the best player in the history of the game. He's our leader. He's our captain. We step back and let him do the leading. As soon as he steps out abruptly, it's okay. Well, now all of a sudden, you guys who have just been the young guys around Faker, you've got to step up, be the leaders, be the veterans for an actual rookie now in Poby, who's supposed to be propped up by these four older players now. And it feels like he's just been left by the wayside, left to the wolves. And then all of a sudden, we're just directly comparing him to Faker and say, well, that's not Faker. No, of course it's not. And that never was going to be. And that wasn't anyone's proper or anyone should have had expectations in this type of situation i think individually i've seen some of those glimpses you've seen some of that pros you know promise and prospect in someone like poby at this point but you also realize how incredibly raw and fresh he is to this type of scene this type of level that this is not that type of step that you would be taking and you would want to protect type of situation how many times did we talk about this t1 lineup and look at the success and go man it's these four incredible young players and they're just bringing along Faker, even if he's not playing at the top type of level. It's been so hard to understand exactly his value, his form, what that means at this point in time in his career. With his absence, with this absolute collapse and dismantling of T1 that we have seen by multiple LCK teams at this point, really, really showing us the value that he held on this lineup. And I really hope he's not rushed back even quicker. Faker and you know gonna potentially jeopardize his health 
for the foreseeable future. I don't think he or T1 will allow that to happen. But, I mean, even if this T1 gets into playoffs, unless there's a huge turnaround, they're not beating anybody in a series. Owner talked about it and he mentioned that, yeah, he's, you know, maybe playing a little bit more and, you know, he's playing some A-Ram, blah, 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 on his account. But he's having sometimes still that numbness in his arm and still having to sometimes use his other arm to buy items in the shop or whatever. Man, shut it down. I, I don't want, never mind his actual future life. And that is the major important type of thing. But if you're talking about any chance of saving what is left of a professional career, shut it down, rest up, get a surgery, whatever it's going to be. These type of issues, carpal tunnel, nerve, numbness, all these things are very serious and need to be treated with the proper time and care. Rushing back just to salvage whatever this is for T1, it ain't worth it in the long term. To me, earliest should be for Worlds. Faker comes back for Worlds, and if they can't qualify for Worlds without him, see you next year. Yeah, and that should be the way that you're looking and never always should have been. Never mind now at this one and six point. That always should have been the way that you looked at this lineup, having players like Zeus, Guma Yushi, which, hey, I don't mean to bring those names up because you know what? Guma's been good. Zeus has been on a week-by-week -week basis where he's been looking maybe a little bit better, kind of a little, but he's at least been there. I think the major problems in what is happening is the performances and communication between owner and Kyrie are the ones that I think a lot of people are highlighting on. Still chance to turn it around, but we need to see some positive signs ahead of that if we're going to have any faith in this roster going forward. We had the LCS all pro teams announced all five members from both Cloud9 and Golden Guardians getting the nod. And how about the change from spring to summer for Mr. Licorice? Because we were talking about him as maybe the worst top laner in the LCS in spring. And now here he is sitting atop the mountain on that first team all pro. Oh boy, salute to Captain Canada, Mr. Licorice, you're doing wonders for us, my man. Yes, absolutely. And this is fantastic because not us, not all just ourselves, a lot of people challenged and identified Licorice as an issue for this Golden Guardians lineup where there's a lot of good happening, but we need this one piece to kind of be at a different type of level, a different thing where you're able to then really flourish. And that is exactly what we have seen since MSI. His play has improved beyond that type of limit that you were looking at it to just be at that baseline where the rest of the team is popping off. His contributions have risen up and as well, the stock of the Golden Guardians has risen up. And absolutely deserved all five members on that squad. Uh, the only... Maybe a couple little nitpicking notes for me is I might put River ahead of Blabber on that first team, all pro. Obviously, clearly, the two best strugglers in the LCS. And then Jimenez in that third spot, you feel like that's mainly because he's on Cloud9 and they're the best team. I feel like guys like Insanity, Palafox, APA maybe didn't play enough games, but there's a couple names that I might put ahead of Jimenez. Yeah, I think that's where I'd like to have that conversation as well. River over Bladder, that's a pretty good one. That's got some spice to it. I think River was more of a difference maker than Blabber had to be this split. And, you know, I don't know how much you're going to penalize Blabber or something for that. That's where I can see that angle where you might want to vault River into that top tier team. And then talking about a menace. Yes, this is someone that I think individually did okay. Okay is usually not what you're looking for when you're talking about one of these all pro teams. You need something a little bit better. And that's where he gets that little bump up because of obviously the results and record that Cloud9 is putting together. One less week, one one little week gone away of Ruby and it's of insanity starting for TSM. I think that that's who would be rolling through into our uh, third all pro team. Another reason to be mad that Ruby was starting games over insanity. But these are announced. That means playoffs just around the corner and insanity is going to be there on the rift kicking things off against evil geniuses these guys just played in the last week of regular season it was eg getting the better of them they're going to be the favorites in this one as they should be very much so looking for the two all pro team members out of eg jojo peon and unforgiven to be the ones to step up Yes, these two are going to be that engine that drives this evil genius's team. If you need damage, you absolutely better believe it's going to be the Jojo Pyun Unforgiven combo that is bringing it through. I think Unforgiven has been somebody that even, yes, getting on that third All-Pro team, 
hasn't quite gotten as many flowers as he probably deserves for how good he has been and how impactful he has been for this evil genius's lineup this split on the other side you're being met by someone that also has uh, beaten out those expectations wild turtle delivering a little bit more than people thought he still had in the tank for this tsm squad insanity is that big flash big exciting piece that we are talking about and you start entering these best of series that champion pool that difference champion pool that's where i'm starting to look for tsm where they can make a little bit of that shake up and try to change this run up and obviously shaden assuming he starts making his playoff debut we'll see how he does as a rookie uh stepping in to that lineup and then the other side we got nrg versus team liquid and if you recall the last time these two squads met was the game that got harry benched that abysmal Akali performance. So these two haven't played since APA came into the lineup. Ooh, APA versus Palafox? Do I smell a nice little domestic what? mid lane In matchup? playoffs? No. Oh boy, we got two of them for the LCS. Talking about insanity and Jojo Pyun and slip us a nice one of these right after. What a North American pride. It's weekend. a new era, you know? But anyways, looking at this one, I think that they're both going to deliver on the excitement and the hype that we want to see to start out these LCS playoffs. And if you're if you're looking at these four squads in terms of dark horse, I feel like EG, I wouldn't really consider a dark horse because they were consensus top three for the majority of the split. TSM or NRG would definitely be a dark horse. And I feel like Team Liquid, if they can find the peak levels that they had throughout the regular season, because if they didn't blow some five, six, seven K gold leads, they'd probably have three more wins on the split. So I'm picking Team Liquid as a team that can go surprisingly deep in this playoff run. The horse team as the dark horse. Come on, that can't be the way that we're too easy. It's <laughs> too easy, man. <laughs> I think they're almost even too good or showing us too much potential to get that Dark Horse type of label because you're looking at these other ones, I mean, specifically TSM and NRG are the ones that I feel that Dark Horse label can really be slapped onto. This TSM team, nobody had expectations for, nobody expected Insanity to be there type of thing. That is that one that you're looking at. And as well, NRG, all the things that have gone through, the questions about what was happening with FBI and Ignar in that bottom lane. I think a lot of it, there's some validity to it, but overall, the way that we have seen the results come through and the performances in game have answered those questions for NRG and, and for the people that were doubtful of this type of transaction for what was CLG at the time. I'm hoping for it. I'm praying for it. My man, Big Dokes. I'm hoping for a big performance from him. You want real Dark Horse? Dig 100 Thieves? We feel in a 7-8 loser's bracket run for either of them? No. no. I'm not banking on either one of these ones at this point for them. I, sure, they can maybe make it a little bit interesting and spicy down there. But overall, uh, on the outside looking in at this point, I can't be making that type of change. Unless Closer plays that final Viego performance, unless he's at that level every game in playoffs, that's probably the only chance 100 Thieves are making any kind of noise. But we'll have to wait a little bit before Dig and 100 Thieves hit the rift in that loser's bracket round. Same goes for C9 and Golden Guardians on the winner's side, but we do have a couple matches kicking off to think for things in those LCS playoffs. But that's it today for League Unlock. Erica Marquis with you beautiful people. Thanks for watching as always, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.